Welcome, Expression family. It is good to be with you today. Um, what, an, what a gift and honor that we get to just gather from all over the world, wherever you're watching from, whether you're local to LA County or you're tuning in from another city, state, country. Be at home. Welcome. We are glad you're here, and it's an honor just to get to worship God with you and press into the Word this morning. Well, quick announcement before we jump into the message. Um, we wanted to let you know that our, we have in-person services um, every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., and then we'll continue to have our online service at 1130. Um, but our 10 a.m. service, we are meeting at a beautiful place um, in Silmar at the YWAM base, and it's this gorgeous outdoor space with just beautiful mountains, tons of shade, place for our kids to play and be ministered to. It's an incredible space. And um, if you haven't made it out yet and want to join us, it's only like 10, 15 minutes north of Burbank. It's actually not far. There's great parking, and we would love to have you if you uh, are comfortable yet to, to join an in-person service. So we're actually going to continue to stay at the YMAM base through the month of June. Um, everybody keeps saying, like, oh, my gosh, meeting outside is so wonderful. Um, so we're happy that we get to do that for just a little bit longer. So join us while you can. Um, all right, well, we're going to jump into the message uh, this morning. We have been in a series here asking God to reset us. Um, if you've been with us, you know this. We're asking God to reset us in every area of our life. And today we're asking, inviting, and inviting God to reset our expectations. Reset our expectations. Expectation, what is it? You know, expectation really is a mindset. It's an attitude. It's a, it's a way of looking at the world. Um, you know, it, it, it's a strong anticipation. It's more than wishing. It's more than hoping. It's a strong belief. It's a, it's a, um, a confidence that what you are expecting to happen is going to happen. Um, it's powerful. It has a really strong determining factor in our lives. And as most of us know, whatever it is you expect is what you end up getting, um, there's actually a lot of science and psychology and, and, and even biblical principle around that. And we're going to look at that a little bit today. Um, but maybe you've experienced this. You know, we've done tons of missions, Hone and I, in our lives. And it's, it's always the person who expects to get sick on the mission strip is the one who gets sick, right? Or the person who expects to be rejected ends up being the one who's rejected. Or the person who expects the raise is the one who gets the raise. Or the person who expects everybody to love them, which Hona's given this example, is him. He literally walks into a room and is like, everybody's going to love me. And everybody loves Hona, right? Um, and so, so often what we expect to happen fuels the realities we begin to walk in. And so ex expectation is really, really important. And... Um, you know, scripture, we're going to get into this a little bit this morning, but scripture has a lot to say about how we are to be expectant in the Lord and how we are to expect good things and we're to expect God to move. And um, one of the big links that we see in scripture is your, how your sight is connected to your expectation. What you're looking at is what you begin to expect and it's what you begin to see manifest in your life. So what are you focusing on? What are we focusing on in this season in our lives, right? Um, join me in Mark chapter 8. I'm going to start in verse 22. And they, and they came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a man who was blind to Jesus, and they begged him to touch him. Taking the man, putting in his eyes and laying his hands on him, he asked him, do you see anything? And he looked up and said, I see people, but I see them like trees walking around. Then again, again he laid his hands on his eyes, and he looked in, uh, intently and was restored. And he began to see everything clearly. And he went home to his home, or went to his home saying, uh, do, not, do not even enter the village. He sent him to his home saying, don't go into the village. So <coughs> this has always, for me, been a really fascinating passage in scripture. It's an interesting story um, for a lot of reasons, but one is that Jesus, in all of his wisdom, thought it necessary and wise 
to remove this man from his familiar settings so that he could heal his eyes. There was something about him staying in his familiar place that locked up the miracle in his life. Interesting, right? I wonder how many, how many of us need to be removed out of our just everyday, familiar, you know, comfort zone, uh, our famili- the familiarity of our life, and, and come away with Jesus so we can get some fresh perspective. Um, something that's also uh, really interesting to me, this is actually the only example we see in Scripture where a healing is progressive, right? And he doesn't get healed all at once. It's actually in stages. He's progressively healed. And um, it's interesting, right? He, he has some vision, some clarity, um, but it's still blurry. And he has to go back to Jesus, you know, heals him and, and fully restores him. This is always interesting to me. <clears throat> I mean, it's kind of silly, right? A miracles are mir- a miracle. They're all like the same, but in terms of supernatural, they all require God. But you would think if there was going to be a, an account of a progressive miracle in Scripture, it would be like when a dead person's raised. Because I don't know, to me that seems harder, right? Maybe they like, they're back to life, but they're still really sick. And then Jesus prays a second time, and then they're totally healed. But we actually don't see that. This is the only place we see that. And it's around this area of sight, which is interesting. Um, I wonder if having our sight or our perception or our, you know, um, our vision, our expectations is an ongoing progressive healing in our life where we continually come to the Lord and ask for more healing uh, to see more clearly. But notice the question Jesus asked the man, do you see anything? What do you see? Can you see anything? Do you see anything on your horizon, right? Can you see something before you? What do you see in your future? Can you, you know, what do you see? Do you see anything when you look at the church? Do you see anything when you look at your family? Do you see anything when you look at your city? What do you see? It's a really important question that Jesus is asking. Do you see any, anything? And, and many of us may be like this man. You know, our response would be, you know, kind of, but it's blurry, And I think this is where the invitation is to invite Jesus to truly touch our eyes, to clarify how we're seeing the world around us in this season, to see what he sees, to see the good, to see the beauty, to see God moving. And so my prayer today as we jump into this message is that God would touch our eyes, that we would begin to see so that when the Lord asks us, what do you see? We would say, I can see what you're doing, God. I have expectation for you to move because I can see what you're doing. The reality is, is what you look at is what you'll see, right? What you focus on is what you're going to experience. Um, Maybe you've heard the story. Somebody in our staff, you know, gave this story before, and it's this kind of proverb or whatever, but it's that a man stood outside of a church, and um, a newcomer came up, and began to speak to the man outside and said, hey, I'm coming from another church. Um, I wanted to check this church out, but, but what's it like in there? And the man at the door says, well, what did you find at your last church? And they said, oh, well, at our last church, you know, people are hypocrites. You know, um, <clears throat> there's just a lot of problems and um, it's controlling and, and the pastors, you know, aren't very educated and... Um, you know, problems with people and all these negative things. And then the man at the door looked at him and said, if you come in here, that's what you will also find, right? And then the next person, same story. Hey, I'm visiting, you know, I'm looking for another church. Hey, well, what was the experience in your last church? You know, it was great. I I met incredible people. God moved. I had, had, you know, I grew. Um, And he says, that's what you'll find in here as well. And it's interesting because I think so often... We, we know this to be true. We see this, right? The, the kid, if you have kids, like, um, you know, we, we always laugh, like, <laughs> when this happens in our family. But it's like, we'll go somewhere, and there's five of us, and four of us will have a fantastic time. And one of the, the kids who had the same amount of fun, everything was great, you know, but because they didn't want to go there, or because they had a negative attitude, they were in a bad mood the whole time, they walked out, they're like, that was awful. And you're like their experience was completely different than everybody else's, right? Um, 
And so I think there's a lot to be said about what you focus on is what you'll experience. But I want to talk to you for a moment about the science behind that because it's very fascinating what we're learning about the human brain. Um, so it's called, there's this thing called experience-dependent neuroplasty. Experience-dependent neuroplasty. And at the heart of the research is this finding that your experiences are actually hardwiring and changing your brain. So what you focus on begins to determine the parts of your brain that fire, that wire, that strengthen. Then as those parts of the brain are switching on and the, and the neurons are firing in your brain with your experiences or your beliefs or your perceptions, there's these lasting connections that are made in the brain that strengthen those memories and influence what the, uh, what the brain will focus on or attend to in the future. <coughs> so if you let your mind settle and focus on negativity, on criticism, on doubt, on fear, on anger, right, on stress, on guilt, or whatever, it actually begins to shape your brain, okay? It begins to shape your brain, and you become actually more vulnerable and susceptible to worry, to depression, to anxiety, to actual, you know, physiological responses, because your brain is now, you know, has learned to respond and to see things with a negative lens. Now, on the other hand, if you focus on positive feelings and frame situations with you know, a tilt toward um, the positive, eventually your brain will take on the shape that reflects this. And then it begins to hardwire and strengthen connections around resilience, optimism, gratitude, positive emotions, higher self-esteem. Uh, neuroscientists say the brain is a belief engine. This is interesting. The brain is a belief engine. From sensory data flowing in through all of your senses, the brain naturally begins to look for and find patterns. We know this about the brain, right? And then it infuses those patterns with meaning. So our brains begin to connect the dots um, of the world and begins to put meaning to the patterns that we're seeing. And so once, and that forms a belief in you, and once that belief is formed, here's what's crazy. The brain begins to look for and find confirmatory evidence in support of your belief. It accelerates the process of reinforcing that belief for you. And around and around this goes, and it becomes this, you know, this positive feedback loop for you. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, hopefully this can make sense. The brain is always looking to find meaning in, in the information that it's getting, right? So once your brain has constructed a belief, men are this way, women are this way, my parents are like this, um, all people are whatever, my boss is this way. I could never do that. I am not. Whenever your you know, brain has constructed a belief, whether positive or negative, um, your, the human brain becomes invested in the belief and reinforces that by belief by looking for supporting evidence, listen to this, while blinding itself to anything contrary. This is called belief-dependent realism. <coughs> And the, the main idea is that what you believe will determine your reality, not your reality determines your belief. So what happens is, if you believe something negative, your brain will go to work for you subconsciously to find you every example to prove to you why that's true. And it will hide from you every contrary example that would challenge that thought. So if you believe you know, uh, women are all a certain way, right? Your brain, without you even consciously thinking about this, will go to try to highlight to you every example where women are doing the thing you think they are. And your brain will hide from you women who, are, who don't do that. And it just further and further and further convinces us of a reality that very well may not be true. We watch this in our society where people are so convinced of realities that aren't true, right? And so it's so important what we're focusing on because the brain will reinforce it over and over in your life. 
That's why it's so important that we don't believe lies about ourselves or about God or about others. Because then, you know, somebody who's expecting something negative is always going to find the negative. Literally, that's the science. They will, their brain will highlight the negative to them all of the time. But somebody who expects good, their brain will actually highlight the good to them. They're going to have a really different experience. Does that make sense? This is really, really interesting. And we know this biblically, but it's interesting to see science trying to catch up to the incredible way that God made us. Um, what we're focusing on is shaping what we're expecting to happen. Um, there's another story of another blind man in scripture. Mark chapter 10, 46 through 52. It says, then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bar uh, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, uh, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. So Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. I love this story. I like weep every time I read this story. I don't know what about it. It's so beautiful to me. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. What a question. Jesus looking at you in the face and saying, what do you want me to do for you? I love his response. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see. And he followed Jesus down the road. Ugh, the story. I love this man's passion. I love his hunger, his willingness just to put it all out there, you know, putting his hunger on display for God. He doesn't care about cultural norms. He doesn't care about his dignity. He is passionately in pursuit of an encounter with Jesus. I want that kind of passion, right? And I think it's so significant that he throws aside his coat. When he hears that Jesus is near, he throws his coat. Now, um, a lot of biblical scholars say that this is really significant because in this time, um, people who were legitimate, uh, had legitimate reasons to beg, right? The lame, the blind, um, they were given a, like a government-issued coat. A coat that, that, you know, clarified this person has legitimate needs, you should give to them, right? It was a sign of, of distress, of poverty, of hardship, it, it, it meant something. And he, when he realizes Jesus is near, he throws the coat. I'm not under this. I don't need this. Why does he do that? That was his lifeline to begging. We don't know how long he had to work or what kind of lines he had to wait in to even get issued this kind of coat, right? He throws it off. Why? Because he expects to be transformed. There is no doubt in this man's mind. He's like, oh, I'm meeting with Jesus. It's on. This old life is over. This pain is over. The struggle is over. There was so much expectation in him, and I love this. And I love Jesus' response to him, right? Because this man is expecting to leave changed through this encounter with Jesus. And it doesn't say that Jesus just healed him. In fact, the, the, what we hear in Scripture here is Jesus says, your faith has healed you. Jesus didn't say, I just healed you. I'm healing you. Here I am healing you. No, Jesus instantly in this moment looks at him and says, your faith has healed you. Your faith opened the door and pulled heaven down. I'm just here celebrating with you. Your faith has made you well. It was this man's faith, it was his expectation, which opened him up to become a prime target for heaven to land on. Expectation is the catalyst for change in our lives. Expectation is the catalyst for encounter with Jesus. You know, in Luke chapter 3, 
verse 15. This is the time of John the Baptist. There's some, some growing, you know, rumors. Is the Messiah near? All this is going on. And, and it says in verse 15, Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, says the people were in expectation in this time in history, right? In the Passion, it says, during those days, everyone was gripped with messianic expectations. I love that. Am I gripped with messianic expectation? Am I gripped with expectation that, that God is on the move, that Jesus is near? The reality was for, for these folks in this, in this story, you know, there had been over 400 years of silence. Leading up to this moment, there's no prophets, there's no words, there's no, you know, inklings of encouragement. And God was waiting for the right moment, the right atmosphere, the right generation to pour out his Holy Spirit. God was searching the earth for the right ingredients where he could show up and really move. Scripture says that the people were in expectation. One translation says the people were on tiptoes in anticipation and expectation. You see, we need to understand that God is still looking for people who are in expectation because he wants to pour out. He doesn't just pour out once in history. God continually, he longs for his kingdom to be on the earth. He longs that, that mankind would know him and experience him. God is looking for expectation. Are we expectant when we get up in the morning? Are we expectant when we come to church that something's going to happen, that we're going to meet with God? Are we expectant when we pray that things are going to really shift? Are we expectant when we bless our children? Are we expectant when we, we sow and we give financially? Are we expectant? Or are we just kind of doing things out of principle? God is looking for expectation. Once again, expectation becomes the catalyst, the, ca the, the target for God to move, right? Because the very next verse after this, it says, you know, the people were in expectation. Verse 16 says, and John answered saying to them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. The expectation in the hearts of the people paved a way for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of fire in their lives. See, Jesus is God's gift to you for eternal life. But the Holy Spirit is Jesus' gift to you to empower you in this life, right? And it's interesting to me that expectation was a part of the equation in the, in the previous, you know, verse that opened up the door for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the next verse. What are we expecting? Are we so expectant that we're casting off the coat we've been wearing of hardship, of frustration, of unbelief, of discouragement? of just being weary? Are we, are we so expectant that, we're, that we know who our God is, that we're willing to cast off the coat that has been placed on us by this past season because we expect to be transformed in the presence of God? See, in Acts chapter three, we see expectation really swing open the, um, heaven's door. Acts chapter three, if you wanna turn with me. Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer, and a man who had been unable to walk from birth was being carried. Now, I want you to catch this. I'm just telling you multiple stories in scripture where somebody's breakthrough came because of their expectancy. Here's another one. It's just like the two we've already read. Okay, it says that a man who'd been unable to walk from birth was being carried, whom they used to set down every day at the gate at the temple, which is called beautiful, so that he could beg for charitable gifts from those entering the temple grounds. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple grounds, he began asking to receive a gift. But Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, look at us. And he gave them his attention. Now listen to this. Expecting 
to receive something from them. This lame man expected to receive something from these two men of God. But Peter said, I don't have silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And if you know the story, the man was healed. Once again, you see this theme over and over in scripture. Expectation sets you up. Expectation is the catalyst for a God breaking in in your life. You know, this passage doesn't say that this lame man hoped or wished or considered. It says he expected to receive. He expected a miracle. He expected a breakthrough. When I think about expectation, I think about my kids on Christmas Eve. Even if we've told them, guys, you know, it's been a hard year. Don't expect too much tomorrow. (laughs) which I totally said to my kids, you know, we're taking it easy, you know, and even then there's so much anticipation and expectation. My kids don't go to bed on Christmas Eve thinking, I'm going to get nothing, (laughs) right? Or the expectation before your wedding day, like most people aren't, aren't, you know, aren't wondering, oh my gosh, is the groom or the bride going to show up? Like there's so much anticipation and excitement and expectation, so much confidence that tomorrow will come. So much confidence in in, in what's coming. I want to have that kind of expectation every time I come to church to meet with the Lord, every time I go to pray, every time I give, every time I, I, when I'm worshiping the Lord, I want to live with this kind of expectation because I want to be primed and open. I want to be a landing pad for the Holy Spirit to move. Be filled with expectation. Be filled with expectation. I feel like this whole past year, this whole past pandemic has put some serious coats on us. Coats maybe we didn't ever anticipate we'd be wearing, right? Of disappointment, discouragement, isolation, whatever. And I want to tell you, you are not bound to that coat. And that it's God is reviving our expectation and he's reminding us who he is. Because I'm telling you, God is faithful, Look at his track record over and over and over again in scripture. He comes through. He came through for for Daniel. He came through for Joseph. He came through for Esther. He came through for Moses. Over and over and over, God comes through. Our God is good. He is not a God who would lie. Our God is powerful. Our God is so deeply in love with us, and he is faithful and just. And it's time that we reawaken our expectation that we expect good. We expect God to show up. We expect God to break in in our marriage. We expect God to break in with our kids. We expect God to bless and break in with our business. We expect God to move. You know, I've noticed, I think this has always been present, but especially lately, after the season we've come out of, many times we don't know how to manage... um, frustrated expectations. How do you manage when your expectations aren't met? How, how do you carry that when you feel like you're just frustrated, when what you're experiencing isn't lining up with what you expected to happen? And the reality is, you know, there's no easy answer. There's no pattern because God's ways aren't our ways. And we have to accept that. God's ways are not our ways. And We have to keep our expectation on him and not on outcomes. And I think this is where we get stuck. So often our expectation is in a particular, you know, formulated outcome. And God just doesn't work that way, right? Our expectation has to be on him, on who he is, on his goodness. Proverbs 19.21 says, Many are the plans in the mind of man, but it's the purpose of the Lord that will stand. Regardless of what my expectations, you know, if they're met or not, I can trust that God's purposes will prevail. And his purpose is always greater than my expectation. Right? It's it's choosing to, to trust and expect that God will be good no matter how it turns out. That his plans for me are good. Not that I'll be rich and skinny and powerful and famous. We put our expectations in all the wrong things because, in fact, Scripture even tells us, right? You put your expectation in what the Bible says, and Scripture tells you you're going to have hard times. So you can expect 
to have some hard times. So don't be so caught off guard when we do, right? We put our expectation in who he is and in his word. Sometimes I think we have our minds um, so fixed on what we're expecting that we, we miss Jesus right in front of us. Jesus was the fulfillment of all the prophecies, but because he didn't look like what they were expecting, they rejected him. I wonder if there's places in my life where I've literally rejected what God was trying to bring into my life because it didn't look like what I thought it should look like. Our expectations are driving our beliefs. Where do our expectations come from? You know, are we getting our expectations from other people around us, how God works with them, what God did for them, their opinion? <clears throat> or are we getting our expectations from the word of God? None of us understands all that God, right, did to bring us to this moment. We don't understand all the pieces. It's, it is a mystery, but we can trust in who he is. We don't want to limit a limitless God. Um, a verse that I've had to meditate on a lot, a lot through the years is, is Psalms 112, 7 through 9. And it says this of the righteous, that the righteous do not fear bad news. They confidently trust the Lord to care for them. They are confident and fearless and can face their foes triumphantly. They share freely and give generously to those in need. The righteous do not fear bad news. Man, anybody who's, who has any level of PTSD, who's been through trauma, this is, a, this is an intense one, right? Because what trauma will do, and it will, it will hardwire you to expect bad things to happen, right? It's always looking for, I mean, and I've, I've been in a season of healing from some trauma for the last, you know, we had some very traumatic things happen in, uh, about five years ago, and, and we're, we're in a season of really healing and, and recovering from that. Um, but how it, it affects you is so wild. Anytime I would hear a noise in the house, Somebody's dead. Like, anytime I would hear anything, I, I'm thinking the worst tragedy, right? The phone rings, you know, somebody's been in a car accident. It's like, where is this coming from? And, you know, obviously there can be the enemy trying to just torment and all that, but at the same time, there's a very real physiological response, PTSD and trauma that this, can, that this happens in us. But this doesn't mean we're stuck there, right? The Holy Spirit heals us and wants to heal our brain, and wants to heal how we, you know, see, and wants to heal and conform us to the image of Christ, because the righteous don't have to fear bad news. They confidently trust that the Lord is going to take care of them. Are we expecting good in our lives? Or are we, you know, constantly expecting to be hurt and discouraged? Are we throwing the weight of our expect expectation behind what Scripture says? And not just what somebody has prophesied over you, because I've seen a lot of people put more weight in a prophetic culture behind what's been prophesied than what scripture says. And that is scary ground. Somebody prophesies to you that you're going to be rich and famous, but scripture says, pick up the towel and go wash some feet. And you're like, sorry, <laughs> it doesn't work that way, right? Where are we throwing the weight of our expectation? Um, what we're focusing on is what will manifest in our world. Um, some of you guys know this story. Um, five years ago, when, when Hone and I took over as senior pastors here at Expression, uh, we were associate pastors before, and we took over as senior pastors, but there was this moment, and we were in Northern California. We were out in this beautiful mountainous area, um, it was late at night. We were in a hot tub all alone. It was just quiet and beautiful with this vast sky above us. And I knew we, we knew we were called to do this, but I was wrestling with the Lord. And I was like, man, God, this has already been a hard journey. We'd already been a decade in, you know, and it was just like, I, I know we're called to do this, but is there going to be grace to do this? Are, is there going to be grace to do this? And because um, we're weary and we're tired and is there grace? And um, so I began to ask the Lord. It felt kind of silly. You know, I was, I was, I mean, it felt silly. But at the same time, I was so desperate. Like, God, I need a confirmation you've called us to do this. And, um, and so kind of being silly, like, 
the number five is really significant to Hona, and he's got all these you know, encounters with the Lord around the number five, and it's always around grace and this whole thing. And so I was like, well, five, you know, means grace to Hona. So, Lord, would you give us five shooting stars as we're sitting here as a sign that there's going to be grace for this? Just kind of threw it out there. And right away I heard the Lord speak to me in that moment. And he said, there's always grace where there's gratitude. And it just like, it sunk in me. And I was like, oh, wow. There's grace where there's gratitude. If your perspective is right, if you're looking at the right thing, it will release the right things you need in your life. right? But if you're focusing on the negative, you're going to find you don't have grace. So where there's gratitude... When you're focusing on what I am, what God is doing instead of what he's not doing. When you're focusing on how good God is instead of, you know, what's hard. When you're focusing on the right things, it unlocks the provision in your life. And I, I shared with Hona what I had heard in that moment. And we just were so convicted and inspired. And so we we're like, we just began to worship the Lord. And we were just in this hot tub, just worshiping the Lord. Just being so grateful and, and, and focusing on him and meditating on him. And one of the craziest things happened. And I'm telling you, this is one of those things that, where it was like, it's so only God. And as we're worshiping God for about 10 minutes, never seen anything like this in my life, but just all of a sudden, boom, boom, five shooting stars <laughs> light up the sky. It was so crazy. We were like, this is, is this really happening? Like, it was so bananas five shooting stars. And at this point, you know, doubting Thomas over here, I'm like, oh, we're, I'm just like hysterically laughing. And I'm like, okay, wait, there probably is like totally a meteor shower and we didn't know, right? Like, obviously. And so we waited out there for another hour and a half. Not one more, not one more, not six, not four, five, five shooting stars. And it was one of those moments where I was like, okay, God, we got the lesson. And then the, the very next week, we stepped into our role here. And it's one of those things the Lord has reminded me consistently, right? What you are focusing on is what you're going to expect, and it's what's going to empower you. So be grateful. Focus on what God is doing. Remember who he is. Put your attention there. And it will provoke expectation for good, and you're going to experience. You'll have grace to walk it out. And let me tell you, that has been the absolute truth in my life and in this season, and in this role. And the second I find myself like, oh, I don't have a lot of grace, I'm like, whoa, I am focusing on the wrong things. This is on me, right? And, um, and so I, I want to encourage you. I'm going I'm to go through some scriptures that hopefully is like a truth bath over you today. Why should you be expectant? Why should you expect good things? Why should you expect God to break in and move supernaturally in your life? in your business, in your community. Why should you expect that? Colossians 2.14, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us, against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Right, so what this tells us, there is literally nothing between you and God. All of your ugly, your shame, your sin, your mess, the things you are embarrassed by have been nailed to the cross. There is nothing between you and God. There is no drama. There is no beef. There is no issue. God sees righteousness when he sees you. Romans 8, 17. And since we are his true children, we qualify to share all of his treasures. For indeed, we are heirs of God himself. And since we are joined to Christ, we also inherit all that he is and all that he has. We will experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings as our own. Scripture tells us we are co-heirs with Jesus. We inherit all of it. We lack nothing, right? We share all of the treasures. You're not in some corner hoping to just get a crumb from God. You are a co-heir to the entire kingdom, you are a child of the living God. You have access to everything. It is his joy and delight to give to you. Deuteronomy 31.8. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. You are not alone. How can God not break in when he's going before you, when he's making a way, when he's walking with you? 
you better expect him to do something because he's with you. You're not alone. Heaven backs you up every day. God himself is with you. He is for you. He will never leave you. He didn't bring you this far to just fall off the throne, right? He has a plan. He has breakthrough planned. He has good things planned for you. He is a good, loving father who is always, always present with you. 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power has given us everything needed for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. His divine power has given you everything you need for life and godliness, right? Why are we stressed out? He will provide what we need. We lack nothing. If he's calling you to do this crazy hard thing and you're like, I don't have the finances to do that. Good. It's him that provides. You get to trust and lean in, right? God, I don't have the connections for that. Good. Trust and lean in. He provides everything that you need to do what he's called you to do. Romans 8, 28, and we know that in all things, all things, friends, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purposes. What does that tell us? God's going to fix it. God's going to fix the mess. No matter what's going on, no matter where it feels like the expectations are, are broken or where you're discouraged or where it feels messy, God is big enough to fix it. He works all things together for your good. He's that good. We can expect him to take the mess and turn it into something beautiful. 2 Corinthians 3.18, but we all with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. Listen, God is not taking you backwards. It is glory to glory. You can expect it. Anchor into that truth. God is taking you glory to glory, right? Your greatest days are not behind you. The best is yet to be. You can expect it. 1 Corinthians 2.9, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the things that God has prepared for those who love him. Do you love him? If the answer is yes, then that means get excited. Get excited. You can't even imagine the incredible things he has planned for you. God is not the kind of parent who's only involved in certain seasons of your life. He is an ever-present, always good father who has good things for you in every season. Acts 2.17, in the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. He's not going to leave you out. He's not going to lead you out. doesn't matter how young you are, how old you are, how female you are, how male you are, how whatever you are. God does not leave anybody out. Hebrews 6.10 For God, the faithful one, is not unfair. How can he forget the beautiful work you have have done for him? He remembers the love you demonstrate as you continually serve his beloved ones for the glory of his name. Listen, it is impossible for God to forget what he's promised you. What's he promised you? He's not unjust. He's not unfaithful. He's not unkind. Get expectant. God does not forget the sacrifices, the offerings, the life poured out. He is so faithful. Matthew 11, 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Get expectant. Are you weary? He's got you. He's got a plan to to refresh you, to revitalize you, but you got to come to him. You're not going to find it within yourself. You're not going to find it isolating from him or from your spiritual community or from everybody else. You're going to find it by running into him. He's got rest for you. We need to start matching our expectation to who he is, to his ability, not to our reality or what we're feeling. Right? The enemy is a liar and wants to lie to us about who we are, about who God is, or about how things are going to turn out. He can do nothing but lie. And we don't want to listen and focus on the lies because it will literally 
begin to create it in our life. It empowers it to happen in our life. As we focus on the truth, as we focus on the word, as we focus on the promises of God, it begins to unlock those things in our lives. What are we expecting? What are you expecting? What are you expecting this summer? What are you expecting in the fall? Do you remember the moment when Peter walked on the water? When Jesus' disciples saw, you know, Jesus walking on the water. In the midst of a storm, they're terrified and they thought he was a ghost and all the drama, right? And then Peter said, Lord, if you tell me to come to you on the water, I will. If it's you, tell me to come. And Jesus said, come. So that Peter got out of the boat. He began to walk on the water and coming towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, when he took his gaze from Jesus and began to put it on the storm, on the thing that was scary, when he put his sight on the wrong thing, what happened? He began to sink. When you look at the wind, when you look at the waves of life, rather than Jesus and the fact that you're walking on water, right? What an incredible moment. Nobody had walked on water before, and here he is, a, a disciple of Christ, walking on water in the middle of a storm with Jesus. And instead of focusing on that, he looks at all what's, at what's going wrong, at what's scary. And because he gives it his, his, you know, his attention, he begins to expect danger. He expects something bad's going to happen. He expects to drown, and so he does. Right? And Jesus saves him, catches him. And what does he say to him? First he says, you have little faith. And then he said, why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? You know, when I look at all the scriptures of who God is, and I look back at his track record in my own life, and I look at at thousands of years of historical record of how good and faithful God has been. Why would I even think about fixing my eyes on the wind and the rain and the, you know, the waves that are around me right now? What power do those have when I'm looking at Jesus, right? Church, it is time that we fix our eyes in the right place and that we get expectant, that we get hungry and expectant for God to move. Romans 12, 11 and 12 says, don't burn out. Keep yourselves, keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. It is time to get wildly, cheerfully expectant in our lives. It's time for us to lock into the truth that there is always grace where there's gratitude, right? There's always provision when we're focusing on the right things. And so it's time that we begin to expect God to break through. It is time that we begin to be the kind of people who expect a Holy Ghost encounter in our lives, right? That we expect the miraculous, that we ex expect supernatural provision, that we expect God to do, to do what he said he would do that we trust that he is who he says he is, that we would trust that we are who he says we are. I want to encourage you, I want to pray over us as we close today. I'm, I'm praying that we would cast off whatever heavy coat we've put on in this season and that we would come running to my rabbi, my rabbi, my rabbi. I want to see, I want to see that we would come expectant, that we would ask God to, to heal our vision so that we can fully receive all that he has for us in this season. Amen? Would you do this with me? Would you put your hands over your eyes this morning? Let's pray. Father, I pray for every one of us, every person watching today. I pray, God, that you would heal our vision that you would help us to see what you see everywhere where it's blurry. God, I pray for clarity of sight. Anywhere where we've been focused on the wrong things, on the hard things, on the negative things, I pray, God, that you would give us tunnel vision to who you are and to your promises and your truth. 
Help us to look at the right things. And God, I pray for wild, cheerful expectation to raise up inside of us. I pray that we would be people who expect good news, that we would be people who expect the raise, who expect breakthrough, who expect God to provide, who expect our children to encounter God, who expect healing in our marriage, who expect a move of God in our neighborhood. Lord, I pray that you would fan into flame expectation, holy anticipation, holy expectation in our lives. Father, I pray that this would truly be a catalyst season where we would step into all that you have for us, that we would cast off the heavy coat we've been wearing and that we would run with expectancy back into our prayer closets, back into places of worship, that we would have so much expectancy in every area of our lives. I pray, God, that when we would show up to church, we would expect a move of God every time. Father, I pray for every person healing from the trauma healing from the heaviness of this past season. And I pray for wild, cheerful expectation to overtake us. Holy Spirit, have your way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bless you, family. I pray that this week you would become so expectant for God to move. And I can't wait to hear the testimonies of what he does. All right, have a great week. We'll see you next week.